One of the biggest hurdles to vastly improving artificial intelligence is memory. AI effectively doesn't have any memory. Once a model is trained, it has exactly whatever was provided in that data set to the model. And context windows, essentially the size of the prompt and response is highly limited. For a while, it was 2000 tokens, which you can essentially say is about 1500 words. Then it got raised to 4000 tokens for some open source models. ChatGPT, the best ChatGPT4 model goes up to 32,000 tokens and Claude 2 is 100,000 tokens. But still, these are highly limiting context windows. And so AI needs to have memory. But now I think we actually have a solution to this. And that's the research paper that I'm going to review today. And not only that, after I review the research paper, we actually have the code. The authors were kind enough to open source their code. So I'm gonna show you how to install it and how to use it. And the project is called MemGPT, Memory GPT. And stick around to the end because we might have a special guest joining us. So let's go. So this is the paper, MemGPT, Towards LLMs as Operating Systems. The main author is Charles Packer with Vivian Fang, Shashir Patil, Kevin Lin, Sarah Wooders, and Joseph Gonzalez as contributing authors. And this is out of UC Berkeley. You can find the website right here, memgpt.ai, which includes the code, the research paper, the data sets they used, and other things. So check it out. But I read through this entire paper and I highlighted the most interesting portions. So let's go over a few of those. And then after, I'm gonna show you how to actually use this project. So first in the abstract, they talk about the biggest constraint being limited context windows, which is totally understandable. And two of the best use cases that really show how limiting that context window is, is long-term chat. So if you have weeks, months, even years of back and forth chat and you wanna keep the conversation consistent, it's really hard to do that with a limited context window and probably the most valuable use case for AI that I've seen today chat with your docs and if you have dozens thousands even tens of thousands of documents that range in pages each you're gonna run out of context window really quickly and there's already been a number of ways to solve this but nothing as comprehensive as what memgpt is proposing and so what they're proposing is a virtual context management system effectively mimicking what your operating system on your computer has. So if you think about it, your operating system has a processor, that's the CPU that does all of the processing and compute. Then you have RAM, which is kind of like short-term memory, which is more limited. And then you have a hard drive or an SSD that is long-term memory and effectively can store as much as you want in there. And the way that an operating system manages these different memory stores is exactly what they're trying to mimic with MemGPT. So they say appearance of large memory memory resources through data movement between fast and slow memory. And I'm going to talk about how they do that in a minute. And here they talk about two specific use cases that they evaluate their methods on. Document analysis, so that's chat with your docs, and then multi-session chat, so chat that can go on back and forth between an AI and a human for days, weeks, months, years. And here's a little bit about why simply increasing the context window is not really going to be a great solution long term. Extending the context length of transformers incurs a quadrant increase in computational time and memory cost due to the transformer architecture's self-attention mechanism. Basically, it becomes extremely expensive the larger the context window you have. And what we've also found is that even within a large context, the large language model tends to forget parts of it. So I'll also touch on that in a minute. And what they're proposing is the illusion of an infinite context while continuing to use fixed context models. So this is essentially an evolution of using using embeddings and more standard databases. And how do they actually do this? The cool thing is that their agents, that MemGPT itself, actually automatically and autonomously manages its own memory. And it does so through function calls, which is a really advanced technique with AI. It essentially allows you to define functions that the AI can use to execute different tasks. And GPT-4 is really good at function calls, but unfortunately GPT-3.5 and even many open source models really lack there. But again, more on that in a minute. So here's a diagram of what they're proposing. Here is the inputs. You have messages from users, you have documents being uploaded, we have a system message, a timer, then it goes through a parser to make sure it's all formatted properly. And you have your virtual context here. So within the virtual context, you have the main context right here, and that has a maximum token limit. That 
that is the fixed context that you're all familiar with when working with a large language model. Then you have your external context, which can have unlimited tokens and unlimited context size. And the main context can be written to with that external context. Then you have the LLM processor, which is basically the large language model inference. Then you have the output. So we have another parser to make sure it all looks good. And the LLM processor will decide whether it needs to call functions to, let's say, retrieve more memory to edit its existing memory or to yield the results and actually output it. And so MemGPT does this completely autonomously. So it says right here, MemGPT manages the control flow between the memory management, the LLM processing module, and user. This design allows for repeated context modifications during a single task, allowing the agent to more effectively utilize its limited context. So as it's performing a task, it can actually retrieve memory, test things out, and then edit its memory again and retrieve other parts of the memory it thinks might be more relevant. And here it says, we treat context windows as a constrained memory resource and design a memory hierarchy for LLMs analogous to memory tiers used in traditional OSs. And they reference a paper from all the way back in 1988, where basically it details what a modern computer memory system looks like today. Here it says, to provide a similar illusion of longer context length, we allow the LLM to manage what is placed in its own context. So the longer context length is virtual memory and its own context is the physical memory. And they're calling this the LLM OS or MemGPT. So let's talk about the actual memory and what's happening. They have the main context, which they say here is analogous to main memory, physical memory, RAM. That is your RAM, what's stored in that short term memory. It's very fast it's readily available. Then they have the external context, and you can think about this as your hard drive, and that's gonna be slower, but unlimited size. And so the fixed context is your RAM, and everything else is your hard drive. And here is a quick table that they show showing the maximum number of tokens for each of these popular models. They have some open source models, they have the GPT models and the Claude models. And the maximum conversation length, assuming an average message size, is very small. So with only 4,000 tokens in Llama 2, you can have 60 total messages that you can provide as context in the prompt. And then on the very highest side, Claude 2, which has 100,000 tokens, you can have 2,000 total messages. Now, given how much I'm on Telegram, I promise 2,000 messages is not a lot. And not only that, here they go on to talk about how the main context is actually smaller than most people think. Even though it says the main context can be 2,000, 4,000, 32,000 tokens, much of that is actually already taken up by the system message, by other relevant information, by historical information. So all of a sudden you thought you had 16,000 tokens, but in reality, you probably have closer to 12. Here it says, in LLM-based conversational agents, a significant portion of main context tokens is generally used to hold a system message. That is when you're telling the large language model how to behave or what personality or role they should take on. And then the pre-prompt that dictates the nature of the interaction of the system, while the remainder of the tokens can be used to hold the conversation data. And not only that, when you get into more complex tasks that you need to solve, like coding, all of a sudden, larger pre-prompts are also very common. So if you need to prompt the LLM with a code base so that it has all of the context of that code base and you want to iterate on that code base, it's basically not possible for any decently sized code base. Here it says, because of the importance of the pre-prompt in dictating system behavior, it is common for the pre-prompt to consume more than a thousand tokens, which means the entire context window in many modern LLMs will be exhausted only with a few dozen back and forth messages between the user and system. And then they also address recursive summarization. So if you remember back a while ago, I made a video about the autonomous agents paper that was completely mind blowing and awesome. And one of the ways that it allowed these agents in this simulated environment to interact with each other and store memories so they actually build a personality over time is by storing their memories in a vector database. But the problem with that is that after a while, you can't provide all 
all the memories necessary to give the LLM all the information it needs. So their solution was actually something called reflecting on memories. So essentially they have a day's worth of memories and then they task the LLM to reflect on those memories and come up with what is essentially a compressed version of the memory. So let's say throughout the day, so many different things happen and the top three things that happen, it will pick out and put as the reflection of that day. And it can actually also do a little bit more complex summarization. But when you do that, and this is what they say here, recursive summarization is a simple way to address overflowing context windows. However, recursive summarization is inherently lossy and eventually leads to large holes in the memory of the system. And you can think about this very similarly to video compression. In fact, Marquez Brownlee made a video about this. He uploaded the same video to YouTube a bunch of times. Each time he would upload it, then download the compressed version, upload it, download the compressed version. And at the end of, I think, hundreds or even a thousand times, that video looked terrible. It was completely pixelated and you really couldn't tell what was going on. So that's what they mean by lossy. And here they talk about how they split their main context. And so it's three components. One is the system instructions, telling the LLM how you want it to behave and what you want it to do. Then you have the conversational context, which is a queue of recent event history. So basically the messages between the agent and a the user. Then you have the working context, which is really just working memory for the agent. Agent. And they say instructions are read only and pinned to main context. So the instructions about how to actually handle the memory, the context window size, all of that kind of stuff is fixed in the main context. So out of our context budget, that's already taken. Then the conversational context is read only with a special eviction policy, meaning it's going to continue to put stuff in there until it runs out of space and starts moving stuff out. Then the working context is both readable and writable by the LLM processor via function calls. So that's essentially where you can just dump all the information and read from it whenever you need. So here's an example of a conversation snippet where MemGPT writes details from conversation to working context without a memory warning from the system. So here we go. The original message from MemGP to the user. Hello, Chad, welcome. I'm excited to embark on this journey with you. As a PhD student in computer science, I can only imagine the fascinating ideas you're juggling. Can you share what you're working on? I am all ears. The user says, I took the day off, my mom Brenda baked me a birthday cake. It was my favorite chocolate lava. So MemGPT realizes, okay, this is additional information that I'm going to need later on. And I'm going to store this in my working context. So here we have a function call, working context append. We have the birthday information, October 11th, which I actually inferred from the date of the message. We have the favorite cake, which is the chocolate lava made by mom Brenda. It probably would have been cool to actually have something separate where it said mom equals Brenda, but I think this is sufficient. And then MemGP replies with happy birthday, nothing like a special treat and then a few other sentences where it's trying to continue the conversation using that information. And now it stores that information for later. Now let's talk about the external context. So here it says external context refers to out of context storage that lies outside the context window of the LLM processor analogous to disk memory. So your hard drive. And so we have the main context that is the actual limited context window of the LLM. And then we have the external context, which is where we have all the other information that we might want to retrieve and used in the main context. And so however, it can be brought into the main context through appropriate function calls. So it's so cool. They are really mimicking how a traditional operating system manages its memory. And I think this is a really smart approach. And here it says, in our experiments using MemGPT for multi-session chat and document analysis, we use databases to store text documents and embeddings vectors, provide several ways for the LLM processor to query that external context, including time-based search, text-based search, and embeddings-based search. And we make a distinction between two types of external context. They have the recall store storage, which stores the entire history of events processed by the LLM processor, and then the archival storage, which serves as the general read-write data store that the agent can utilize as overflow for the in-context read-write core memory. So recall storage is what has happened, and then archival storage is everything else. Archival storage allows MemGPT to store facts, experiences, preferences, and then search over recall storage allows MemGPT to find past interactions related to a particular query. And here they start talking about how it actually 
happens. How does MemGPT actually manage memory? And this is done through memory edits and retrieval that are self-directed and actually executed via function calls. And so how they do it, we implement self-directed editing and retrieval by providing explicit instructions within the pre-prompts that guide the system on how to interact with its memory systems. Basically, it's saying, here are the functions you can use, here's the context limit, here's how you can move things back and forth. These instructions comprise of two main components, a detailed description of the memory hierarchy and their respective utilities, and a function schema, complete with their natural language descriptions that the system can call to access or modify its memory. So here's another example. Hello, Chad, it's a pleasure to finally have a conversation with you. I'm Samantha. I understand that you're studying computer science and have a keen interest in pretty dynamic areas like Formula One and sailing. What in particular draws you to these interests? And then the user says, speed, of course, the thrill and the adrenaline. Here, the system actually starts to provide a warning. And the warning is the maximum context length is being reached. And that's when MemGPT will jump in and actually start managing its memory. So here it says it's going to append to the working context, key personality trait. The user enjoys high speed adrenaline rush activities like Formula One racing and intense gaming sessions in CSGO. Now, I didn't see where this person mentioned CSGO, so I wonder if that's a hallucination or not. I'm not sure. And not only that, but MemGPT can actually correct false information that it has. So here's an example. MemGPT, welcome back. Fancy a chat about horror movies, any particular film you've watched recently that stuck with you. The user says, actually, I don't like horror movies. I'm more into romantic comedy. And then MemGPT realizes, oh, I have false information about this user. Let me update it. And so we have working context dot replace. I watch horror horror movies with I like romantic comedies. My apologies for the mix-up earlier. Romantic comedies are a delightful genre full of laughter and heartfelt moments. Do you have a favorite romantic comedy? So now going forward, MemGPT knows this user likes romantic comedies, not horror. Okay, so how did they actually test all of this? Well, they ran experiments, and as I mentioned before, they did so really in two ways. They tested it against long-term chat dialogues. So between a user and the AI, back and forth over thousands, tens of thousands, of messages. Then they also tested it against document retrieval or chat with your docs. So here they talk about how MemGPT was used for conversational agents. So actually chat dialogues. And they're looking at two main factors, consistency and engagement. For consistency, the agent should maintain conversational coherence. New facts, preferences, and events mentioned should align with prior statements from both the user and agent. And then second, engagement. The agent should draw on long-term knowledge about the user to personalize responses, referencing prior conversations makes dialogue more natural and engaging. So that's how they're measuring MemGPT for conversational agents. So here's an example of how it actually works. So the user says, hey, remember that time we talked about music? What was the artist you mentioned you could get into? So here, now MemGPT, so you can think about this as almost like an internal dialogue. User is asking about past conversation. Recalling our discussion on music, I will search my recall memory for the artist's name. So here we go, here's the function call with music, search recall storage music, finds it in in recall storage, ranks it very similarly to how an embeddings usually works. And then it says, from the conversation history, it seems that the artist I mentioned I could get into is Taylor Swift. Let me confirm with this user. And then the bot says Taylor Swift. So that's basically how it works. It's able to look into its past memory and find relevant examples. Here they introduce a new concept called deep memory retrieval, DMR. And DMR is when the conversational agent is asked a question by the user that explicitly refers back to a a prior conversation that has a very narrow expected answer range. So it's like, hey, remember that thing I talked about a month ago, that very specific thing? Do you remember it? That's basically what it is. And here it shows a little bit about the performance of GPT 3.5 alone, GPT 4 alone, and then using MemGPT. So here we can see that the accuracy of the responses is actually really good and better than these AI alone. Another way they're looking at it is conversation opener. So basically when the chatbot first says hello, they want to be able to keep it really personal and engaging and they'll reference things that they've mentioned in the past like hello I know you like cookies do you want to talk about chocolate chip cookies today as a silly example so here it says in the conversation opener task we evaluate an agent's ability to craft engaging messages to the user that draw from knowledge accumulated in prior conversations and the authors believe that when you reference facts 
and information from prior conversations, that makes the text much more engaging. And I, I agree. And here's the chart of conversation opener performance. So MemGPT with working context and recall storage. And here we go, 0.187. MemGPT with working context only, 0.20. So effectively the same. And recall storage only, which is basically MemGPT having access to the entire conversation history. And so let's look at this. So this is the gold persona. So this is basically the gold standard of what it expects. I am studying the LSAT. I want to be an attorney. I used to live in New Mexico in a small town. I grew up with horses. I love coffee. I love tea. The gold opener. So this is the human baseline. What is the expected opener? What date is your LSAT test scheduled? Here's the MemGPT version with working context plus recall. Hello there. Just brewing up a fresh pot of tea on my end. How's your coffee ready to burn the midnight oil with some LSAT study? Great. Then MemGPT with working context only. Hello, it's great to have you back. It's time for a fresh cup of coffee. As a tour guide at our local museum, I meet so many people who say a good brew helps keep them focused. How's your LSAT study going? So perfect. And then with recall storage only, it's basically just a generic reply. Hey there, it's always a pleasure to see you online. Let's dive into the world of shared ideas. Now let's talk about document analysis. This is an area that I'm particularly interested in because a lot of companies who reach out to me for AI consulting need chat with your docs. And that is an extremely valuable use case already. So one thing I wanted to point out is it says open AIs and then in parentheses, they put closed. I'm not sure if that was an intentional dig at OpenAI, but I found that hilarious. But here they talk about document analysis. So even with state-of-the-art open source Llama 2 models, they have a 4K token limit. Anthropic has 100K tokens, but many documents easily surpass that length. Stephen King's best-selling novel, The Shining, contains around 150 words, which is about 200,000 tokens. So one book already bigger than the largest context window that we have available today. Now, imagine you're a business and you have tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of internal documents that you need to query against. It's basically not possible to fit it into a context window. And it also says many real document analysis tasks require drawing connections across multiple such lengthy documents. So you need to be able to have a lot of different documents and provide all the context all at once. And here's something super interesting. Recent research also raises doubts about the utility of simply scaling context since they find uneven attention distributions in large context models. Basically, the model is more capable of recalling information at the beginning or the end of its context window versus tokens in the middle. This is so fascinating. I remember when I was probably in like seventh grade, the teacher did this experiment where he went up front and he said, I'm going to list off 10 words. He didn't tell us anything else. And he listed off those 10 words. He said them out loud. And then right after he says, okay, now I want everybody to write down which words you remember from the list that I just said. We all wrote it down. And what we found is that everybody remembered the first words he said and the last words he said, but much fewer people actually remembered the words in the middle. And this is essentially what large language models are showing. So they are really reflecting what the human mind is capable of, which I just find to be so fascinating. Okay, let's look at these charts now. This is the accuracy of answers from questions given questions about a large set of documents. So here on the x-axis, we see the number of documents retrieved and from zero all the way up to 700. Now this red line reflects the context window window limit. So what we see is GPT-4 performance is actually really good, but as soon as it hits that context window, the performance drops significantly. Same with GPT-3.5. And in fact, the GPT-3.5 starts out as a lower performance than MemGPT. However, look at MemGPT. It doesn't matter how many documents you have to retrieve, the performance, the quality, the accuracy stays the same. And then on the other side, we look at nesting levels. So here's the accuracy depending on how many nesting levels we have. So as we nest more information, the quality stays the same with MemGPT and with GPT 3.5 and 4, it drops significantly quickly. And there are some drawbacks, of course, but these seem pretty minor. So here it says a trade-off in retrieved document capacity created by MemGPT, more complex operation. Same token budget, so you're working with the same fixed context window, but a non-trivial portion of MemGPT's token budget will be consumed by system instructions required for MemGPT's OS components. So you're telling the large language model how to actually 
manage its memory in every single prompt. And so that does take away some of the token budget. One last thing I wanna talk about before I show you how to actually install and use this project. Here they reference LLMs as agents and it actually references Park et al, which is the paper that I mentioned earlier, the paper that I did a full video on, which is that paper about autonomous agents behaving kind of like humans when given memories and, and a simulated environment to live within. So here it says, Park et al. proposed adding memory to LLMs and using the LLM as a planner and observe emergent social behaviors in a multi-agent sandbox environment. So very cool. And one more limitation. While GPT models that have been fine-tuned for function calling still require a parser to verify outputs as valid function syntax, we observed that GPT-4 function fine-tuned models rarely made syntactic or semantic errors on the MemGPT function set, whereas GPT-3.5 fine-tuned models consistently generated incorrect function calls. And then they also found that the most popular Llama 270B model variants, even ones fine-tuned for function calling, would consistently generate incorrect function calls. So this is not only a problem for MemGPT, but function calls and open source models are going to be critically important. I've done a bunch of videos about Autogen, and Autogen uses function calls. And so we need to get to a place where these open source models can do function calling really well, because I personally don't want to continue paying GPT-4 prices. And so that's what they talk about here. And on the note of Autogen, imagine how cool it would be if we can put together Autogen plus MemGPT to give these agents unlimited memory. I know people are working on this already. I know there's an open issue on the MemGPT GitHub page, so I think it's coming sooner than we know. All right, now with all of that said, let's actually install and use MemGPT. As I mentioned, the authors were kind enough to give us the actual code. I love papers with code, so thank you. So I'm at memgpt.ai. Here's the paper, here's the Discord. They are very active in the Discord. And then they also have the data sets here. So here I'm gonna click on the GitHub page and this is it. They have a few demonstrations of how it works. They have pretty good documentation, but keep in mind, this is a very new project. And a lot of what they worked on is the LLM OS aspect. So a lot of the other things that make it easier to use an LLM OS like memgpt are not quite there, but they're adding them quickly. So feel free to jump into their Discord. I'll link it in the description below. Okay, so let's install it. The first thing we're going to do is click this green code button, and then we're going to click copy next to the GitHub URL. Now, I've already gone through the install. So rather than going through it again, I'm just going to highlight what I did and show you. I'll also drop a gist as I normally do in the description below with all of the commands that I used. So the first thing we're going to do is right here, we're going to clone the repo. So git clone and then paste the repo that we just copied. The next thing we're doing is create creating a new Conda environment. And if you don't already have Conda installed, be sure to install it. You can Google how to do it. We use it for every project on my channel. So if you watch my videos, please get that installed. It is so valuable. So here we're gonna do Conda create dash n memgpt python equals 3.10. Once that is done, we're going to highlight this right here, Conda activate memgpt, and then we paste it in right there. Then we hit enter, and now we can tell it's working because we have it right there. Once we do that, we need to change directory into the memgpt folder. So we do cd memgpt and then we're in that folder. Next, we have to install all the requirements. So we do pip install dash r requirements.txt and that will install all the requirements for this project, which is what you're seeing here. Then next, we're gonna do export OpenAI API key equals and then you put your OpenAI API key. If you don't already have an OpenAI API key, go ahead and sign up for OpenAI, generate one and then copy it and paste it here. Don't worry, I'm gonna revoke this this API key before I publish this video. And that's really it. And since yesterday, they actually added new functionality. Before you had to generate your own embeddings and now it's built into the project. So now I wanna show you how to do document retrieval, chat with your docs with memgpt. So the command is right here, python3 main.py dash dash archival storage files compute embeddings equals, and then we're gonna to point to the location of our documents. And you can actually use the wildcard star right here, so star.txt, and it's gonna grab within that folder all of the text documents. Now, you can put anything you want in there, but what I did was I used the SEC filings, which I'll link in the description below, that was provided as the example by memgpt. So. Once you do that, it's actually gonna give you a compute charge. So this is how much it's gonna cost to do all of these embeddings. So for these three documents, it's 12 cents. Then we continue and confirm. It took about six minutes to do all of these embeddings. And then once it's done, it saves it 
and then here we go. We can actually ask questions. Now, one mistake I made is that I just said, how much revenue did each company make? And I didn't explicitly tell it to reference its archival memory. And you have to do that unless you can actually customize the persona to say, always reference your archival memory. And you can actually customize the persona to do a lot of things. You can say, don't query the API as much or handle memory in a custom way. So it's really cool that you can do that. So then rather than doing that, I just asked it directly in line. And I said, based on your archival memory, how much revenue did Lyft and Uber make last year? And then here, this is MemGPT, kind of that internal thought. The user requested revenue details of Lyft and Uber from last year based on my archival memory. I need to search the archival memory for this information, creating two separate queries to find this information for both companies. Here we go. We have a function call updating memory with archival memory search. It's querying it. And then it says, okay, I found that information. Then it's querying the second document, same thing. Okay, found that information. And then it replies back, hello, Chad. That's defined in the persona, so you can change the name. Don't worry about that. I found the information you're looking for. The revenue for Lyft was 8.399 billion and Uber's was 31.877 billion. And then I started asking something else. I said, based on your archival memory, how many times did the word driver appear in the Lyft and SEC filings. And it actually was starting to go through every single one. And I thought this was going to get quite expensive. So I actually stopped it there. And all of this does get very expensive, but I know they're working on adding open source models and they already have a lot of the code written. So I'm excited to see that when it comes out. If you want to see me do another tutorial when they actually include open source models, let me know in the comments below. But that's it. That's all I'm gonna share for today because that's just an intro to what you can actually do with MemGPT. It's a very early project, but it's evolving rapidly. So I'm really excited to see what the authors do here. And speaking of authors, that's who we have today. We're lucky enough to have the authors of MemGPT with us today. And I wanna ask them, what inspired you to create this project? And also, what are your short-term and long-term plans for MemGPT? Hey everyone, I'm Charles. And I'm Vivian, and we're part of the team behind MemGPT. So to give you guys a brief breakdown with MemGPT, we're really just trying to get around the memory issue with current LLMs. So with current language models, the only real memory in the system is just what goes in and out of the language model. And that's usually fixed to around 8K tokens, about 32K tokens. That's about, let's say, a few dozen to 100-ish messages. And beyond that, if you send more messages than that, you have to start throwing things away. And with MemGPT, we effectively make the language model inside of MemGPT that might still have a limited memory self-aware that it has limited memory. So when it gets a notification, for example, that it's going to run out of memory, it will actively start saving um, the important facts, maybe it's learned about you during the conversation or itself, into a permanent memory store that won't get lost. And through this kind of self-editing memory system, you can get agents that no longer have this issue of memory that just gets erased as the conversation goes on. And in terms of what we'd like to do with MemGPT, on the short-term uh, roadmap that we have, we'd really like to support more user workflows. So for example, we've already enabled uh, embedding search over text files that users can feed into MemGPT. And then we'd also like to enable frameworks like uh, Autogen. And then long-term, our main priority is to not have a reliance on GPT-4. So whether this involves improving the performance on GPT-3.5 or tuning our own open source models to sort of replace this LLM layer inside MemGPT, that's kind of what we have for our future plans. All right. Thank you for joining us. And if you liked this video, please consider giving a like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.